Good morning and a warm welcome uh, to um, this service. I was going to say to church, but church is the gathering of God's people, which this is not. This is a virtual uh, service and I'm delighted that you're able to join us and I'm glad that we do have the technology, whether you're watching on YouTube or whether you're listening on the phone later, that we have the technology so that we can still meet around God's word uh, today. As we begin, I want to read the shortest psalm in the Bible, Psalm 117. And it says, praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we praise you this morning. We praise you as the Lord of heaven and earth, the creator of all things the one who made the nations, and to whom all worship is due. Father, would you please help us today as we look at your word, as we pray together, even although we're scattered, we gather virtually together, and we ask that you would be with each one of us, speaking to us, helping us, strengthening us, and sending us out to serve you. And we ask all of this, for your glory, so that the nations may praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, this morning, we are going to continue with the last of our six points on our Grow and Go. Uh, it should appear on this, the screen beside me, but so far we've seen York Evangelical Church exists <laughs> to make disciples of Jesus Christ by growing and going. And we grow ourselves, we grow one another, we grow the body of Christ and we go to Yoker, Clydebank and to the ends of the earth. And Ewan in the last two weeks has shown us, that, uh, talked to us about what it means to go to Yoker, what it means to be as a church going to Clydebank or, or concerned for Clydebank. And this morning we're going to finish with the ends of the earth. And next week Ewan's going to look at Matthew 28 and just bring all of these things together. But today, I want us to be thinking about the nations, thinking about the ends of the earth. That's, that's what we have in view. Now, just a few notices. Uh, the first is to say that we have our prayer meeting, as always, uh, this Wednesday. Um, if you're able to join us, please do. Uh, it's on Zoom. If you haven't joined before or if you have lost the details, get in touch with uh, one of the elders or Janice and we can forward that the details to you. Um, secondly, just to remind you that the quarterly business meeting will be on the 24th of February. Again, that will be on Zoom. And if you have anything that you want to be covered in any other business, uh, if you're able to let one of the elders know uh, before then, that would be great because it just gives us time to, to give it time in the meeting uh, and kind of consider how we'll, we'll approach it. Um, Final thing to say, if you're wanting to get in touch with one of the elders, if you're wanting to do that in the next week, can you contact uh, Ewan or uh, Bill or Bob, because I'm on holiday. Uh, you can contact me, but if you can go through those three first, that would be best. Um, and then the final thing is just to, to come before God in prayer. Um, we're going to pray particularly for, for Matty. Um, She's decided to move down to, it's odd to announce, saying this through a video, um, but she's decided to move down to Manchester with Mary. Um, and so we're just going to pray for her as she prepares for that move. And we're also going to pray for Sheila and Leanne and the rest of the family, and especially for Irene, um, as Irene's uh, daughter's funeral will be on Thursday. So we're just going to um, remember that family. So let's come before God in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning uh, and we just thank you that even although we're not able to meet together, that you are with each one of us. That as we uh, watch this or listen to this, you're with us by your spirit, speaking to us, ministering to us, comforting us, encouraging us, challenging us. And Father, we ask that you would be with us and, and help us. Lord, we particularly want to pray for Matty. Father, we thank you uh, so much for her and for the part that she has in this, uh, in this fellowship. 
And we thank you that she has come to that decision and feels at peace about moving down uh, with Mary and sees that that is, is best for her and for the family. And I, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, help Matty as she prepares to go, and especially in these strange times um, where nothing feels normal. I pray that you would uh, help her. I thank you that she depends upon you and knows that, that you will be with her and you will lead her and guide her. And, and I, I praise you for that and ask that you would go ahead of her. Father, we also want to pray for Sheila and for Leanne and particularly for Irene and the rest of the family. Lord, would you please be with them this week? Father, we ask that you would uh, help them grieve. Father, we ask that you would comfort them in that grief. And I pray especially for Sheila and Leanne uh, that in this time of trouble, they would be able to point the rest of the family uh, to you. Lord, we live in such a broken world and so much is, is difficult and hard and especially just now we, we feel it all the more. And so we know our need of you every moment of every day and we ask for you to help each one of us. We pray for others in the congregation who are particularly struggling just now, whether we know that they're struggling or not. Lord, you know and we ask that you would be near to them and help them. And finally, Father, we bring before you this theme of world missions. Father, we, we come to you and ask that you would enthuse our hearts. We ask that as we look at your word, you would minister to us, speak to us, help us to see your heart for the nations, your desire to see all people brought into your kingdom. Father, help us to see the need for you to be glorified to the ends of the earth. Help us to see that that is what we were made for and anything else is a, just a pale and horrible shadow. Father, we long for your name to be known to the ends of the earth. And we ask that you would help us today to see what our part in that is. So please help us, we ask, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so we're going to do this in, in a couple of different sections. So we're going to look first of all at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So if you've got a Bible there, please turn to that. Um, we're going to look at Jesus' commission, or his mandate almost, uh, to his disciples and what that means for us today. And then we're going to look later on at an example of a church being involved in world missions, going and sending the church of Antioch uh, later on in the book of Acts. So as we begin, let's read Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, world missions is, is no easy thing, is it? It's not something that we, we talk about that much. We talk about it often enough, but it's not always on our agenda. But when we, we think about the state of the world, we think about what's going on, we very quickly start to realize how much our world needs Jesus. And we start to feel that challenge of, of what can we do? And I want us today just to begin by thinking about the billions of people across the world who don't yet know Christ. In the past two weeks, we've thought about the 20,000 in Yoker. And we've thought about the enormity of the task of seeking to reach that 20,000. We've thought about the, the 50,000-ish in Clyde Bank. And the enormity of trying to reach that group. Today we're talking about 7 billion people. To the ends of the earth. And trying to reach that group of people. Now, have I made you feel small? <laughs> I've made myself feel small. How, what on earth can we do? I want us just to backpedal and think, there are billions of people in the world who don't know Jesus. That means that there are billions of people who are living, tormented, enslaved by sin, lost, lost in their lives and eternally lost, and in need of a saviour to rescue them and to restore their relationship with God. But not only are we talking about the need for these people, but we're also talking about God's glory like we read in Psalm 117. 
that all nations owe worship to their creator God. That's what we were made for, what we were designed for. And not only do we want people to be saved for their good, but also for the glory of God. That he would be glorified as he should be, honored as he should be, extolled in people's lives rather than them worshiping themselves. And so it's with that dual focus that we come. And I want us to to begin with a, a quote that I read this week. It challenged me deeply. It was written in the 17th century by a philosopher and scientist called Blaise Pascal. And he said, if eternal damnation is possible, no sacrifice is too great to prevent that possibility from becoming a reality. If eternal damnation is possible, no sacrifice is too great to prevent that possibility from becoming a reality. Let that sink in for a wee moment, because what we're going to talk about today involves sacrifice, personal sacrifice, church sacrifice. But if it is possible for human beings to spend eternity in hell, then no sacrifice could be too much to prevent that possibility becoming a reality, could it? Now, perhaps you're you're hearing that and you're thinking, I agree. I agree. In my head, I agree. I hear that. An eternal damnation is such a huge thing that there is no other sacrifice that could possibly not uh, be justified in view of that. But perhaps you're already thinking, but Greg, I don't know that I I can or I don't know that I want to or it, it sounds hard. I don't really like it when you start sermons talking about sacrifice. And it's true, it is hard. We find life difficult. We often find life hard. We often hear these things and think, how on earth is Yoker Evangelical Church going to reach Yoker? Never mind Clyde Bank. Never mind the ends of the earth. It just seems too hard. It seems too big. But that's what we're going to look at today, to see what the Bible says our role is in this world plan of God to bring the nations to himself. So looking again at Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We're going to think about this under uh, three headings. Who, what and where. So first of all, who? Who is Jesus speaking to? This is after he has been crucified, he's been raised from the dead, and it's just before he ascends to the Father's right hand to reign in glory. And he speaks, and who is he speaking to? He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Who is you? Well, if we we go back up to the top of the page, if you've got a Bible, you can follow. Uh, Verse 2 says, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. That's who Jesus is speaking to in this verse. He's speaking to his disciples, the eleven that are left after Judas has betrayed him. And he's speaking to these eleven men who he has chosen. There's possibly some other hangers online around as well. He's speaking to these eleven and saying, you are going to be my witnesses. You are going to take the good news of who I am and what I've done to the world. You The ones I've chosen, the ones I've walked with for three years, the ones who saw me arrested and crucified and raised, you are going to be my witnesses. But I think that you expands, doesn't it? And we even in the book of Acts, we see it expand. Because how news spreads is it starts with a small group of people and it spreads and it spreads and it spreads. Other people become witnesses, not primary witnesses like the disciples were, but secondary witnesses, witnessing to what they have heard rather than to what they have seen. It gets passed on, and even in this digital age, it's the same. Somebody tweets something. I don't know if you do Twitter, but if if someone tweets something, the more it gets retweeted, the more it gets retweeted. And eventually it balloons as more people tell more people. And it's been the same with news for millennia. One person tells another person, and then the two of them tell other people, and then the four of them tell, and it just spreads like that. And so when he says, you will be my witnesses, 
He's speaking primarily to the disciples, but then that spreads to us. So that's the you. That's the who. Who is to be the witnesses? It's the disciples first and foremost, and us by extension. What are they witnessing to? Look very carefully, because I think often when we think about Christian witness, we think about saying, you're a sinner who's facing judgment. Jesus died on the cross so that you could be saved. You need to believe in him and repent, and you'll spend eternity with God. And those things are true. But that's not what Jesus says they're to be witnesses to. Look what he says. Verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What are they going to testify about? What are they going to witness to? They're going to speak about Jesus, who he is, the eternal Son of God made flesh. Who he is, the one who walked around Galilee, the one who preached, the one who raised the dead, the one who stilled the sea, the one who willingly went to the cross, saying, Father, not my will, but yours be done. The one who hung there and died, even although he could have commanded a legion of angels to come and destroy his enemies. The one who was laid in a grave. The one who on the third day rose again and appeared to his disciples and to many, many others. The one who ascended and is now seated at the Father's right hand as our advocate. The one who intercedes for us today. This is not an abstract piece of information about how we're saved. This is Jesus, the one who saves us, our Savior. And we are his witnesses His disciples are to be his witnesses, to speak of him. All that he has done, all that he has made possible, that sinners can be forgiven, that sinners can be brought back into relationship with God through their great high priest, the Lord Jesus. That's who they are to witness about. So that's the uh, the who and the what. Sorry, I just said who they were to witness about, but that was the what of the witnessing becomes the person of the Lord Jesus. And then thirdly, where? Where are they to witness? Now, I know you've been missing my uh, beautiful artwork, so I'm going to go for it. You ready? So they're going to uh, be witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's lovely, isn't it? The gospel is to go out, Jesus says. It's to go out to the ends of the earth. It's to start here. You're to be witnesses in Jerusalem. You're to reach people. I should do it all the way. It's not just to the northwest and the southeast. It's to all four corners of the earth. It's to be to all places. You are to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Have I missed one? And to the ends of the earth. (laughs) doesn't matter. You look at your Bible, see if I missed one. But the thing is, we, we have the same commission. And maybe you're starting to see why we had those uh, different levels of Yoker, Clyde Bank, and to the ends of the earth. We are to be witnesses in Yoker, Clyde Bank, and to the ends of the earth. You can maybe put in UK or Scotland in there. But we have the same commission. We have to be focused on reaching this space that we're in. First and foremost, the disciples were to preach in Jerusalem, to see people saved in Jerusalem. And then from there, to go out in ever increasing to Judea, the surrounding area of Jerusalem, to Samaria, which was into kind of enemy territory, non-Jewish country, and to the ends of the earth, to all nations, so that all would hear of the Lord Jesus. And we have the same commission. We've to be here in Yoker, building up this church, seeing people saved and coming to a knowledge of Jesus and living to serve him. That's one of our callings. But we're also called to see the, the, the kingdom of God grow around us as well, to see people in Clyde Bank come into faith. But we're not just to be satisfied with our wee corner. We're to be concerned for the reaching of the nations to the ends of the earth. Now again, you're thinking, but how on earth are we going to do that? 
I see, I understand the verse, Greg. I see the who, I see the what, I see the where. But how? How are we to do that? We are just small, insignificant human beings. How on earth can we be involved in the evangelization of the world? Look at verse 8 again. How does it begin? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Do you think that these 11 men could have begun that work of reaching the ends of the earth? There's no way that they could have except for the fact that they received power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. The same Holy Spirit that is given to all believers when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus. When we become Christians, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in each one of us and empowers us so that we are empowered to be his witnesses in Yoker, Clyde Bank, and to the ends of the earth. Now, as we move on to, to look at the, the task that's still ahead of us, I want us to watch a short video, just five minutes. Um, it's made by Platform 67. And I think, it is, of all things that I've seen recently, it helps me to see the task is not yet done, and we still need to be at work. If you're listening on the phone, I'm sorry you won't be able to, uh, to watch it, but I'll give you a wee recap in just a moment. Holy quiet grips the night Tremble at the sight Son of man just split the sky Every saint and every scholar Every king and every pauper At the name of Jesus All fall face down From holy ground will rise To meet the bridegroom in the sky From earth to heaven There are 6,850 peoples with fewer than 2% evangelical Christians. 1,568 are unengaged. You know what that means? No Christians, no missionary. God, I give you what I can today. These scattered ashes that I hid away. I lay it all. of my deepest shame the empty places where I've worn your name show me the love I say I believe oh help me to lay it down oh Lord I lay it down Let this be
So my question now is, how shall we think and feel about the nations? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then you just catalog the benefits and you soar with the sovereign God. I mean, what's left? And what's left is there are millions of people who don't know what you're talking about. Where I die, my Lord with thee, crucified. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I hope that was helpful uh, just to, I suppose, to have a visual representation of the nations, to remember the seven billion people that live on our planet. And just to remind you of a couple of the, the facts that we heard, or if you're listening on the phone, to tell you a couple of the facts that were there. There are 1,568 people groups who are unengaged. That is, groups of people with their language and their customs who have no Christians in them and no missionaries. They have no way to hear of the Lord Jesus. Another statistic is that a third of the world's population live in parts which are, are called uh, unreached. That means that the church there is too small to evangelize its own peoples without outside help. They will not see the church flourish and grow and be able to train its own leaders unless they receive help. They are termed unreached. That's more than 2 billion people living in unreached people groups. So what are we going to do about it? Do we feel that, that pain as we recognize that there are billions of people worshiping false gods, living enslaved to sin, and heading for a lost eternity. Billions of people across the world who don't worship God as he deserves to be worshipped, who don't worship God in the way that they were designed to do, but live in rebellion, in rejection of him, cursing him and worshipping false gods, worshipping created things rather than the creator who should be forever praised. But what are we going to do about it? What can we do about it? Well, in order to, to think about it, I want to look at a worked example from the book of Acts. If you've got a Bible there, please turn to Acts chapter 13. And we're going to look there at the church in Antioch and what they do and see if it's a model for Yoker Evangelical Church. So just to tell you about this church in Antioch, uh, in Verse 19 of chapter 11, you don't need to turn to it, but it says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, that was in Jerusalem, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. So this, this church came into existence because of the persecution in Jerusalem. And they were scattered, spread out to Cyprus and Phoenicia and to Antioch. And it is there that we see this takes place in chapter 13. So chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. It says, Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, 
Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So I want us to see, see three things here. The first is what they were doing as a church. Did you see what they were doing in verse 2? While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting. The church was committed to worshipping God. Fasting to, to show their need of Him. To say, we need you, God. More than we need food in our bellies, we need you. They were worshipping Him, knowing that He was the Creator and Saviour of all. Recognising his place in their lives and in, the, and in the world. And so from that place of worshipping and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. We're not told how he spoke, whether he, he spoke through a, a prophecy from someone or whether he spoke through all of them having the same idea at the same time and they thought, this is too much of a coincidence. It can't just be from us, it must be from him. But however he did it, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and he gave them this message. He said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. He said, I've got a special task for Saul and Barnabas. And I want you to set them apart and I want you to send them to do what, they, what they're called to do. And then verse 3, after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. This church in Antioch sent their two of their best preachers. Barnabas was known as an encourager. I imagine he was a delight to have around the church. Saul had trained at the feet of Gamaliel, the, the best Pharisee in the whole world. His Bible knowledge was second to none. Having him around as a teacher would have been amazing. But they were called to send Barnabas and Saul, to send them out. And so because the Holy Spirit said that, they obeyed, they fasted and they prayed, and they sent Paul and Barnabas out. Now I've got a wee map which should appear on the screen just to tell you what Barnabas and Saul did. They left that church in Antioch. And hopefully you can trace it as they go to Cyprus. And they preached the word in Cyprus and then they went to Poseidon Antioch. And they preached the word in Poseidon Antioch. And then they carried on and they went to Iconium and to Lystra and Derbe. They went to all these places proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus. But then I want you to see what they did next. They went out, sent out from Antioch, went to all these different places, and then what did they do? Verse 26, from Italia they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door for the faith, a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. After they had gone to Cyprus, I mean, this is a huge area. If you can remember the map, I imagine it's not up anymore. Jerusalem was away down to the south of, of Antioch. They go in the opposite direction. They go across the sea to Cyprus. They go away over the sea up to uh, Iconium and Lystra and Derb. And they go in and start telling people about Jesus. Spreading the good news. Witnessing. But after they've done that, they don't go, Oh, well, we've, we've been here. Where shall we go next? They decide to return to Antioch to tell that sending church what God has done. Remember, there's no WhatsApp, there's no email, there's no Zoom, no phones, no, probably not even really any letters that they could send back to Antioch. Not easily, they would have had to send somebody. So they go back to Antioch to tell them what God has done. Did you see that in verse um, 27? On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Imagine that you were in that church and that months had passed and then someone says, here, Saul and Barnabas are back. We're meeting and they're going to tell us what happened. And the whole church gathers together, crams into wherever they met 
And Saul and Barnabas start to tell of all that God had done. Telling of how he had opened a door of faith for the Gentiles. Telling of all the Christians that had come to faith. Telling them that there were Christians in places where previously there had been no Christians. Telling them that there were churches in places where previously there had been no churches. They told them these things. Can you imagine sitting there in that room listening to this? This church who sent them, now they return to tell of what God has done. And they praise God and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. And I want us to see that this is a model for what churches are to do, what Christians are to do. Notice that it's not individuals who send Paul and Barnabas. It's the church together who send Paul and Barnabas, who commit them to the Lord and send them off with prayer and fasting. And I want us to think today whether we are goers or senders, whether you are a goer or a sender. It seems like that's the only two options, to either go or to be sent. And I think Jesus today it, through his spirit is doing exactly the same as he was doing in the church in Antioch. He's still saying to some, I want you to go. He's st- saying to Paul and Barnabas, I want you to go. And he's saying to others, I want you to send. I read recently of uh, William Carey's friend who was instrumental in sending him to the mission field. And he said, if, if the missionary is like one descending down, a, down a, a shaft, down a pit, down a mine, the local church is the one holding the rope. There's, there's two roles. There's this, the sent one and there's the senders. There's the goers and the church who send. And Jesus is still doing the same. The Lord Jesus who came and lived and died and rose and ascended still sends his people to the ends of the earth through his church. And he still says to each one of us today, will you go or will you send? And I don't think there's another option in scripture. And so as I want to apply this to us. And I, I, I know that people listen to missionary sermons and their first instinct is, I do need to support missionaries more. That's true. But first and foremost, I want to challenge you. Can you go? Should you go? Is God calling you today to go? Don't dismiss it. Think about it. I want to tell you of of four people that popped into my head yesterday. I want to tell you of Joe Potter, who went to Bible college to train to be a pastor. And in his first year, he found out that he was amazing at biblical languages, at Hebrew and Greek. Like, He didn't even have to try. He was just amazing at it. And people said to him, you need to translate the Bible. You need to to join Wycliffe. You need to go somewhere that doesn't have a Bible in their language, and you need to translate it. That's what God has gifted you to do. And so he stayed on four years at Bible college. He moved to Portugal to learn Portuguese, which was the second language, and then moved to Mozambique, where he is now translating the Bible. It wasn't what he had in mind, it wasn't what he planned, but it's what he did. I want to tell you, they've gone out of my head. Who was my second one, Ewan? I want to tell you about my friend Vicky, who some of you have met. I can't believe I forgot Vicky. Gillian, don't tell her. Vicky, who trained as a doctor from a non-Christian home, decided to go to Vietnam to tell people about Jesus. And her parents can't understand it. You, went, you got all your grades at school. You became a doctor, the, the best profession in the country. You had all those opportunities. And you've decided to move to Vietnam to tell people about Jesus. But that's what Vicky was called to do. And that's what Vicky has done. I want to tell you about, about Jenny. She stood here in this building and told us that when she was a child, she heard somebody preaching about world missions, about the millions of billions of people not millions of billions, millions and billions of people who had not heard and would not hear about the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that comes through him. And at at that young age, she thought, that's what I should do. That's what I should do with my life. 
And then finally, I want to tell you about uh, Reagan and Gracie, who I met on Zoom at a prayer meeting a couple of weeks ago, who recently retired in the United States and decided to move to Berlanark in the east end of Glasgow because they'd heard that the church there needed help. That's amazing. At the time when most people are putting their feet up and saying, oh, I'm just glad I don't have to work anymore. I'm going to play golf or read books or do crosswords or whatever. They said, where can God put us now that we could serve him better? Don't dismiss it. Whether you're young, whether you're old, is there a chance, is there a possibility that God is saying to you today to go? And if he's not saying to you to go, then he is saying that you have to send. Send as an individual, send as a church. What are you going to do? What are we going to do? I've probably told this story before because I love it. My friend uh, Tony used to work for a a medical mission charity, and it was his job to to try and raise uh, funds. And one of his tasks, which he quite liked, was going to visit the kind of big donors uh, to find out, you know, how they were, whether they were happy with the mission and all the different things. And one day he had to go and visit one of the biggest donors, who gave, I think it was, I think it was half a million, but it might have been a quarter of a million pounds a year to the mission. And he went to visit them, thinking this house is going to be amazing. And he met a single guy who lived in a two-bedroom, semi-detached house with an Astra in the driveway just delighted to give away his money. That's amazing. I want to tell you about a church that I was a member of down in London, who I think were the best I've seen at supporting missionaries. They had sent missionaries uh, to northern Iraq, to Turkey, uh, had them all earlier on, to the Middle East, to Mozambique, the potters they sent them, and to Uganda. And they, every week at the prayer meeting, we prayed for them. Every Sunday evening service, uh, one of the members who had responsibility for that missionary would come and share a little of what one of the missionaries was doing and then pray for them. We gave to them financially. And when they, when they came back on furlough, we would have a lunch and they would stand at the front and they would tell how God had opened a door for them. The work that God was doing through them in the place that they had been sent to. They followed this model of Antioch. And I want to challenge us today. How can we be doing that as a church? I'm delighted that we've decided and committed to sending Jenny to Japan. We've committed to, to giving her three and a half thousand pounds a year. We've committed to, to praying for her regularly. We've committed to supporting her in any way that we can. And when she comes, when she goes, uh, we'll pray for her. And when she comes back, we'll want to hear about what God has done. But can we do more for Jenny? Can we give more? Can we support her in more ways as we send her to Japan? Or perhaps we might be able to do more as well in in sending more missionaries to more places, being involved in sending to the ends of the earth so that the nations will hear the good news of the Lord Jesus. What more can we do as we send? As we finish, I want to finish just with a couple of quotes. The first one I've read already to you. I want you to just dwell on it, think on it. This is Blaise Pascal again. He said, if eternal damnation is possible, no sacrifice is too great to prevent that possibility, to prevent that possibility from becoming a reality. If eternal damnation is possible, no sacrifice that we could make is too great to prevent that possibility from becoming a reality. And then secondly, another wee quote from C.T. Studd, because last week's was so good. He said, if Jesus Christ be God, and died for me. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Just allow those things to sink in. And then let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that there are still 
millions of people across the world who do not know and will not have an opportunity to hear and to respond to the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Father, we ask that you would break our hearts for them. Father, help us to love them as you love them. Help us to have the same desire that they would hear of Jesus and be saved. And Father, help us. Help us to, to pray, to worship you and to pray, to fast and to ask, is this your will? Do you want me to go? And if it is not for us to go, then Father, please help us to be willing to make sacrifices so that we can send and send well. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're just going to think of, uh, reflect upon a couple of questions. Um, three questions while we listen to a song. The first question is, why do you want to be involved in world missions? Just think, what is it that excites you about it? Why do you want to be involved in this? Secondly, what can you do as an individual? And thirdly, what can we do as a church? We're going to listen to This Is Amazing Grace. Uh, it's a song we haven't sung before. I hope you enjoy it. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Thank you. 
as we finish, let's uh, close with just a couple of verses from Psalm 72. It says, Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Amen. And I hope you have a great week.